The University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today we have speaker, Dr. Tong Mu from Princeton University. He's gonna talk about the challenges in conserving migratory shorebirds at multiple scales. Hi hey everyone, uh, thanks for having, having me here. My great honor to be invited to give a seminar here. So I've been working on uh, shorebird conservation and uh, ecology along the east coast of China mostly uh, for the past 10 years. And today I'll talk about the challenges in conserving those magic shorebirds that we all share uh, at multiple scales. Uh, so my research focuses on the East Asian Australian Valley, uh, which uh, Australia, China, and US are all part of it. And the bluebirds move along uh, this flyway, they breed in the north and during, uh, spending their non breeding season in the south. Uh, and uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about the amazing work that has been done by Rich and others here. And it's actually because of the monitoring of those birds in this part of the world that first ran the alarm that the shorebirds along this flyway are declining precipitously, primarily because of the loss of their intertidal stopover habitat in the Yellow Sea region uh, due to land reclamation. So uh, in this map of one of my field sites, you can see this highlighted uh, bluish area or where the uh, historical uh, the historical range of the tidal bed, uh, much of that has been reclaimed and some remaining tidal bed is uh, just a small portion of what it used to be. But I put a question mark there uh, for purpose, uh, for on purpose, because we do uh, when we compare the rate of uh, when we compare the trend of habitat loss and the trend of uh, sober decline, we see they match pretty well. We see the decline of kind of flat area across the years and the decline of strawberries across the years. But when we look into the actual rate of their population decline and habitat loss, we see from the 1980s to the 2000s, the habitat loss in the Yellow Sea is declining at 1.2% per year. But then when we are looking at the rate of population decline in a similar period, we see that the rate of population decline is actually much faster than the rate of habitat loss. Some of them can be uh, six fold higher than that. And on top of that, we see there's also huge interspecific differences in this population decline rate. So also the work from here from monitoring shorebirds uh, not breeding population uh, in, Austra in Australia and New Zealand so on this figure here, the x-axis is the Yellow Sea reliance, which means the proportion of the population that go through Yellow Sea during the migration. So one means like the entire population go through Yellow Sea region, and zero means uh, they seldom visit Yellow Sea. On the, on the y-axis is the flyway level population trend, which is basically the annual rate of population decline. So this is 8% per year decline, and that's 4% increase. Uh, per year. But we can see that this Yellow Sea reliance seems to capture their population trend pretty well, but those are only shorebirds that uh, spend their non breeding uh, season in Australia and New Zealand. So if we add other species, for example, the Sumo sandpiper, which winters in Southeast Asia, pretty late in Benjard, and all of the population goes through Yellow Sea during migration, the points is there. We define by a historical 26% per year, which is outrageous. And now it's slowed down a little bit, but still it will be somewhere here. And then if you add another bird that uh, spend an average season in Southeast Asia, which is the North Man's Green Shank, which you can't really see, but the population of it hasn't changed very much. So we see that just by adding those two points, we found that this yellow sea reliance can't really explain the whole range of uh, interspecific variants that we observe in the population trends. And then on top of that, there's also this degree disagreement in the local trend of population, uh, local trend of habitat loss, and the local trend of uh, shorebird population decline. 
So this is a recent work led by Professor Ma and uh, his students. So on the x axis is a change in the total tidal flat area at each of the site, which is also number. So all these number dots represent one stopover site in the Yellow Sea region, or they represent uh, 15 of, uh, 14 of them. And on the y axis is a change in the species abundance. We can see that there's really no clear trend in this relationship between the change in the habitat loss at the local scale and the population decline at the local scale. So uh, then the question is whether habitat loss is really the main threat. And I'm asking this question not because I'm questioning whether it's true or not, but mostly because I think there's actually more into this question. And I'm actually a firm believer that habitat loss is actually, and it has, has been, and it's actually still the main threat of the shoreboard decline along the flyway. Um, but there are also other threats that we need to consider when looking at that, uh, like habitat degradation, climate change, and hunting. Uh, but all those observations uh, sort of made me to start to think that we need really need more mechanist mechanistic understanding of habitat loss to understand if it is a really main threat, how habitat loss can actually lead to those similarly contradictory observations that we observe between the trend of habitat loss and population decline. And just to give you an example, so if a small area of habitat loss can really lead to a large population decline, which would be really alarming. It means that we can't really afford losing any of the remaining habitat or any of the really key habitat. But on the other hand, it also means that we really know where those habitat, those key habitats are. We don't really need to restore or protect all of the sites, all of the area. We may be able to have a small uh, effort in conservation to protect or restore a small area with really large population benefit. So then the question that I've been asking myself in the past several years are, so which are those habitats at the local scale and which are those sites and why some of the species are more vulnerable than the others to habitat loss? And then how we can actually quantify and showcase the effect of habitat loss because when we think about hunting or other forms of uh, direct mortality uh, that leads to population decline, it seems very obvious. Uh, when I was doing field working on room, we saw uh, raptors hunting those uh, shoulders, and we, uh, we feel really sad seeing those things. But we seldom observe the direct consequence of habitat loss. So how can we actually showcase the effect of habitat loss by uh, using field observations or uh, modeling? And then based on those understanding, how we can conserve shoulders and habitat more effectively. So uh, I pose this question in the following of my talk, I will introduce a local scale study where I look at the heterogeneity of the head of that and see how that will affect Robert uh, population and the local scale. And then I will scale up uh, talking about how quantifying the set use and the quality of that software site will help us to translate those local habitat changes into global level population or uh, local level population declines. And I will finish by talking about some challenges in uh, sort of uh, applying this framework and some of the other emerging threats that the shorebirds are facing along the flyway. First into the local scale study. So um, I think maybe you're pretty familiar with the coastal tidal flat, but when we call it a tidal flat, it's actually not flat uh, because it's actually an uh, elevational gradient that's bounded by the high tide mark and the low tide line, over here is mostly uh, either a cliff or a uh, natural uh, vegetation, but in China, it's mostly bounded by seawall because of land reclamation. And due to the uh, tidal cycles, uh, due to their differences in their uh, exposure, submersion uh, pattern, we can further divide this tidal flat into the upper zone, the middle zone, and the lower zone. And there's the gradual changes from the upper zone to the lower zone of not only the exposure time because of tidal movement, rise and ebb, but also the sediment composition and the vertebrate distribution uh, along the tidal flat. 
So for those of you who may not be familiar with it, so this is the data from one of my field sites. So again, on the x-axis is the distance to the high-time arc. So the same uh, axis as this one. On the y-axis is the distance along the shoreline. So it shows some uh, variation along that direction. But we'll just focus us on the uh, this direction. We see that the distribution of steel of silt, not steel, of silt, <laughs> which is the uh, finest particle that we get on the mud flat, uh, is concentrated on the upper tidal flat. So yeah, upper zone of the tidal flat, which means that that's the part that's the most muddy. So uh, if you go through that part, you're uh, much better. You can walk relatively easily, uh, easily on the uh, outer side, outside, but that's a difficult part to get through. So we see that distribution, uh, that gradual change in the sediment uh, composition, but also the distribution of the invertebrates. So for example, this bad valve macfa, we see that they're mostly concentrated on the middle zone, despite some variation on this uh, direction, but they're mostly concentrated in the middle zone. Now the question is, what about shorebirds using this type of fact? I think uh, when I, started working on shorebirds, I started birding shorebirds. A common uh, notion that we heard is that the birds, when we are doing shorebird survey, we're mostly doing them during high tide. When they're concentrated there, it's easy to count them. And then a common notion is that they will disperse when the tide uh, gets lower, when, they, when the tide starts to recede. So, uh, if we plot their distribution on the uh, tidal flat gradient, so this is the sea wall that's, from, that's forming the high tide uh, mark. So all these dots represent individual shorebirds, and this is where the tide is. Uh, so we can see that during high tide, they're all concentrated in sort of the remaining habitat that's remaining tidal flat that's exposed. And then uh, when the tide starts to recede, a common notion is that they follow the tides out and out onto the uh, lower tidal flat. So that is what we call a tide follower. But then by dispersing during low tide, there can be other ways of dispersing. For example, there might be some species that are zone specialists, so they still concentrated during high tide. But then with the tide we see, they disperse a little bit, but still concentrate on the upper tidal flat because that's possibly where the food is. There's no point of them going out to the other part of the tidal flat if there's no food for them. And then there's also a very generalist that they use whenever or wherever the tidal flat is exposed. We also we can so all those diff, all the three different types of distribution. Uh, we can also, we can all get the feeling that they're dispersing in low tide, whether they're following the tide or whether they're just getting more and more sparsely distributed on the exposed tidal flat. So we wanted to test whether it is actually the case, whether some birds are tide followers, some are non specialists, and some are journalists. Um, and we developed a uh, statistical test to test those distribution based on where the centroid of their movement is. So for example, from the general list, uh, if we plot the proportion of the tidal flat exposed on the x-axis and the position of the centroid, which is uh, this uh, triangle, red triangle shows. So we can see when the entire tidal flat is exposed for general list, the centroid will be in the middle of the tidal flat. So we can get a line. If we plot the changes in the location of the centroid, we'll get a line of uh, slope equals to five, uh, point five. When the entire tidal flat is exposed, the centroid will be only at the middle of the tidal flat. And then for zone specialists, similarly, you can get uh, a segmented line where we don't care about what the slope for the first line, but the second part of the segment is a flat slope, a flat line, not flat slope. Uh, and then for the tide follower, because they're following the tide, then the position of the centroid will basically go towards the end of the tidal flat. And now we have a way of testing those distribution 
And what I did is that I closed two field sites, one in the North CLC called Nanpu. So there's, this is where Beijing is, uh, to give you uh, some reference. So the north side in Nanpu and south side in Rudong. And this is where Shanghai is. The two of the most important stopovers are in the yellow sea. And we set up these transects covering the entire tidal flat uh, gradient and uh, from two kilometers to about five kilometers wide. And we counted shorebirds in those uh, segments, in, in those transects, in those plots, covering the full tidal cycles. So we really want to know what they're doing, not just during high tide, but also during the entire tidal cycle when it's low tide and ebbing for uh, uh, incoming tide. With relatively high temporal resolution, I would say, that for we get uh, the number of orderly trovers in each of those plots for every uh, 30, meter, uh, 30 minutes. And then we also mapped the distribution of sediment and bursic invertebrate, benthic invertebrates along those transects um, to, to compare uh, how those sediment and benthic invertebrate distribution may explain the distribution of trovers and also to see like, how those sediment and benthic invertebrates are changing seasonally. So this is the data from one uh, field site. So we see that really there are not so many tight followers, but many of them are actually zone specialists or generalists. And also some of the species were not able to assign them to any of the category because those three types are not mutually exclusive. Um, but then more importantly, because we did this uh, full tidal flight, full tidal cycle mapping, we were able to quantify uh, how much time times how much birds. So it's a cumulative measurement of the number of individuals and the number of time, the duration they're spending in each of the uh, upper zone, middle zone, or lower zone. And not surprisingly, that for generalists, uh, the upper zone is actually the place where most time, uh, most individual times birds are spending, uh, mo mo most individual times time are spending there. So uh, it's actually providing the most significant foraging opportunity for the generalists. And then for the zone specialists, because most of them are upper zone specialists, not surprisingly, they're also using the upper zone most uh, of the time. But then for the head follower, because, because they're following the tides, you don't see very much variation in their uh, foraging opportunity among those different zones. And um, this importance of the upper zone is actually not just because of the longer to, uh, exposure time of the upper tidal flat. We were able to show that the distribution of the food are all almost always concentrated on the upper or the middle zone. So these are the four most abundant uh, taxa we have in one of the field sites. Now on the x-axis is the distance around the four line, on the y-axis is the distance to the high height. So this will be the upper zone, this will be the middle zone, this will be the lower zone. So we can see that for most of them, uh, they're concentrated either on the upper part of that or the middle part of that. So, with that, we actually confirmed the idea that tidal flight is highly heterogeneous, where the upper zone, which is the most food rich portion of the tidal flight, and that's a place where that's exposed for the longest duration. So it's the most important part for trovers to forage. That means a small loss of the upper tidal flight can actually lead to really large local bird population decline. So just to give you another example, again, the swamp of sandpiper uh, in Delta Ni, Jiangsu, China. So my field, my southern field set will be roughly here, but this is a newly recognized uh, important stop oversight for swamp of sandpiper, where half of their population are to during both north and south uh, migration. And the total global population is just about 500 individuals. So this uh, red area, is the development, the coastal development that finished in 20, 2013. And this red, uh, this yellowish area is 
the current foraging area of spoonbill sandpiper that will be observed during field work, but also confirmed by satellite tracking. And this black area is the proposed development after this first phase of development that aim to develop about half of the remaining habitat, which luckily didn't happen. But we can imagine that we don't really need to develop half of the remaining habitat, maybe not even 10% of the remaining habitat to really wipe out the local population of snow sandpiper at this site. So it just shows uh, visually how a loss of small area of the habitat can actually have really large population consequences uh, at both local and global scale, potentially. But unfortunately, upper zone is also the most threatened part of the tidal flat. We can see whether it's land reclamation, uh, you might have heard about the encroachment of the invasive spatina. Uh, it's also uh, occupying the upper zone first, and then sea level rise. So if you imagine that the upper zone or the high tide mark now is bounded by the sea wall, there's no way for the tidal flat to migrate inland. So effectively, when the sea level rises, you're losing the upper tidal flat, although the water is rising from the lower tidal flat site. But then also some of the emerging uh, threats like mangrove deforestation and people start to build solar panels directly on the tidal flat, which is also on the upper tidal flat. So a simple message or simple conservation uh, strategy from this world is to protect intact tidal flat where there is still remaining upper tidal flat. So if, if you got to choose where to put a port or some other industrial development, maybe it's better to trash what has, what has already been trashed instead of uh, reclaiming the remaining upper tidal flat. So for a uh, intact tidal flat, you'll have the upper, middle, and lower zone. But because the upper tidal flat is always the, more, the first to, uh, to be developed, so when the product is finished, what's left might just be the middle and lower zone. And that might be where we want to extend your project instead of reclaiming the remaining uh, upper tidal flat of some other intact tidal flats. And then, uh, because this project is just based on two sites, um, and we see some species to switch their strategy or the distribution between those two sites. So the next phase uh, of the product, we are doing some satellite tracking of three representative species, red knots, green knots, and butter goblets, uh, which is actually part of my field work uh, in the past three weeks in North and West Australia in Peru. So we are tracking those uh, three different species not only just to understand their migrant routes, but also what they're doing uh, at the slower side, uh, what their local habitat use patterns across the entire uh, uh, migration routes at each of the slower side. So we already got some quite exciting data, at least I think it's pretty quite exciting. So with this red knot, uh, and these are the distribution uh, or their location, foraging location that we got. Uh, in seven days, and if you so, this is Robot Bay, and this is where Broom is in northwest Australia. Um, you can see that it's actually providing us pretty high uh, temporal and spatial resolution data about the gear distribution, not only for now there uh, in Broom, but hopefully when they start when they start to migrate next uh, fall uh, or boreal spring. Um, you'll start to see how they're distributing uh, along the highway. So this first part, uh, although it tells us that the upper tidal flat is very important for shore birds, it's not quantitative enough. So we want to scale up to see uh, how we can better quantify the effect of habitat use, uh, effect of habitat loss on shore bird populations at both local and global scales. And I will provide a framework uh, first, to see how uh, we can achieve that by quantifying the set, uh, set use by shore birds and also the habitat quality and provide a uh, field case, a field study uh, of the uh, framework. So, uh, one of the challenges 
to quantify the effect of capital loss on shorebird uh, is, in my mind, the decoupling of local habitat and local migrant populations. Uh, to explain what I mean by that, if we think about a simple uh, migration network, migration route, where there's a breeding site, two stop over site, and a breeding site, uh, for each of those circles, so the fill, the, the area of the color, means the current habitat use intensity. I'll explain more how we are measuring it in, uh, later. And the all time means the current capacity of the site, meaning how many birds there are can be at the site. And I see that, imagine that we start from a relativist steady state where each of the sites are fully occupied by the same population of flow birds. If there's a habitat loss at the site that wipes down half of the current capacity of the site, then the number of flowers there will decrease by half. So we get a half circle there. But because the flowers are migrating around the same flyway, it's not hard to imagine that all the other sites will have lower number of lower number of individuals. So the idea here is that the local migrant population are affected both by the changes in local habitat, but also by changes at somewhere else. So for example, the stop over site two, there's no habitat loss. But because there's habitat loss in stop over one, it's affecting the total the global population. So the global population there will also decrease. Which means that when we see local habitat changes, it does not necessarily mean the local habitat also changed. But in addition to that, now imagine that there's another habitat loss at the stop over site two where it's increasing by half, we won't really see very much change along the flyway because originally it was under capacity. Only half the site was used by half uh, of its capacity. If you decrease it by half, there may still be enough food resources or space for the bird to use, and it won't see any of the changes at local scale or the global scale. So, for some sites that are used under capacity, they can actually tolerate some degree of habitat loss, which also means that when we observe some local habitat changes, it does not necessarily mean the local population will change and the local uh, or the global population will not change. But the problem is that we don't really know where we are currently. So when we uh, when people observed global decline in the Austra in Australia. It's similar to this case. Now we know that habitat in Australia may not have been changed. We also know that maybe it has changed as well, uh, owing to some like recent study on the Barrison curve. But let's forget about that for a moment. But we see that uh, we know that the habitat or it's changed to a lesser degree anyway. So some of the site will be under capacity, will be used under capacity. But we don't really know in the Yellow Sea what's really the case, whether because of the really extensive habitat loss that all the sites are still at capacity or some of the sites are actually below capacity. So to really identify the keynote for conservation of shrubbers and to quantify how the local and global population may respond to local habitat loss, we actually need to know not only the current bird use at each site based on the abundance, and actually we need more uh, sophisticated measurement of that. We need to know the migratory connectivity, the structure of the network, uh, not all groupers migrate that, that way, uh, with that simple uh, migrant routes. Also, I think more important, we need to know the carrying capacity of those huge sites. So what is the current maximum potential that those sites can actually still hold groupers? And then the keynote for conservation are actually the ones that are at capacity and not necessarily the ones that are supporting more flowers. So in that simple case, we will be that side because any further loss of the solar habitat at this site will have both local and global population consequences, not necessarily at the other side. So then how we can better measure this current habitat use or carrying capacity? So for not breeding site uh, or the breeding site of a residence is relatively easy because you can simply compare the abundance because 
during uh, not breeding or breeding seasons or for residents, there will be a time where you can actually compare how many birds are there at site A, how many birds are there at site B to see their relative importance based on abundance. But for silver site, the number of birds at a silver site will be constantly changing. So people have developed a metric called peak abundance, which is basically like the maximum number that a site can support during stopover period. But the problem is that habitat loss at a silver site can actually affect not only the peak abundance where fewer numbers of birds are visiting those sites, but it can also uh, affect the stopover duration, meaning that the same number of birds may pass through the, uh, the stopover site, but they're staging for a shorter period. So we can see that depending on how the population are uh, responding to the local habitat changes, the peak abundance may be affected or not by this habitat loss. So it's not a really good measurement of the importance of how the stores that are being used by troopers because there is no temporal component in it when the habitat loss can affect both the stopover duration and the peak abundance or the total abundance of birds. So uh, what I would propose is that the bird days, which is the cumulative abundance of a specific uh, stopover period, can be a better measurement of this current habitat use which is basically this size, the area of the curve, uh, the area of the side under this curve, which is a composite measurement of both the abundance and the stopover duration of those birds at the stopover site. And it's actually tightly linked to food or to have the quality that they measure based on food. If you translate that, food, uh, that have that quality and divide it by the food consumption rate, you can actually get a measurement of the carrying capacity based on food uh, abundance. So to test that idea, uh, we focused on red knot. Again, in my northern field site in Nanpu, uh, because this site supports uh, about half or even close to 100% of the entire uh, red knot population that migrate along the highway of both Rogersa and Pierce by uh, subspecies. And the thing is that the red knots, they feed almost exclusively on this small bivalve there, so which it makes, a, makes it easier for us to quantify the habitat quality for them. So what we did is that we monitor their uh, changes in red knot numbers at the field site throughout the migration season, where the solid dots are the counts, and then these lines are uh, linearly interpreted. So we can call it the birthdays uh, which is uh, about 600,000 birthdays uh, in the year of 2018. And we also mapped uh, the distribution of the small bat valve on the entire hollow bat. Um, we're on this uh, heat map. This is the sea, this is a cattle flat, and this is a permanent land. Uh, the color denotes the density of the bat valve. Uh, the red is the uh, uh, most abundant places. And then combined with the estimated food intake rate, we estimated that the current capacity is about 900,000 uh, bird days, which means that the current bird use at that site is about 30% below its capacity, which does not mean that it's okay to develop the 30% of the habitat because we can see the bird entries and the food are all concentrated on the upper level of that again. But the key message here is that despite of the importance of this site that is supporting the entire, almost the entire population of the right now during south uh, northward migration, it may not be limiting the population growth. So the bottleneck of the population may be happening somewhere else uh, during uh, long migration that way. So now to summarize uh, what I've learned so far and to uh, mention some of the emerging threats. So if we go back to the question that I asked at the beginning, whether habitat loss is a main threat to trooper population declines. I think my uh, post study provides some potential mechanism, mechanisms to explain these observations we have that seemingly uh, to explain those seemingly, uh, seemingly contradictory trend between habitat loss and trooper decline. So, with the heterogeneity within the head of bat, the 
uh, disproportionate importance and vulnerability of the upper habitats may be the reason why we're uh, we can get faster population decline with uh, a small amount of habitat loss. And then because there's this site and species specific habitat use patterns at the local site, for example, the uh, pet followers may not be affected as much as the zone specialist or the journalist by the uh, loss of uh, upper habitat plants. So we can get a few interspecific differences at the local scale. And then uh, with the second study, based on the site use and capacity, because the habitat changes and at the important or the limiting site does not have to be occurring across the flyway. The habitat loss does not, does not have to occur across the flyway to lead to uh, the population decline that we observe. We have to just knock out some of the key nodes around the flyway, which may be just one of the 10 sites. Uh, and then, because different species have different migration networks, then the network structure, uh, the network structure uh, determines how knocking out or degrading one of the nodes will affect the entire population that pass through the network. And then, because of this decoupling of local habitat changes and local population changes, we sometimes see this disagreement between the local trend and habitat, uh, local trend in habitat loss and flower because they can be affected by what's happening at the local site and what's happening somewhere else along the flyway. And then, so ideally, if we can have a site network of where the birds are actually passing through and combine it with the current capacity and the current use of those sites, uh, we can start to simulate and predict how local habitat change may affect true birds at both local and global scale, which this uh, where this current capacity and current site use has been uh, generally not considered in the uh, previous work of the network analysis. But it's actually pretty challenging to do the current capacity estimate because for all those show birds around the flyway, we, we don't know their dietary information. And we were lucky to work on right now because we know that their diet and we know they actually focus on that single diet, which is easy to quantify. But for species that eat on 10 different species, it's 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 gonna be really challenging to estimate them if we know what they eat. And they have we don't know uh, many of their habitat use patterns at different sites. And current capacity is not just about food. There's also interspecific competition, prediction, and other factors that will modify the current capacity that's determined by food availability. And there's also temporal changes, and we have to do it for every site. So in this way, it seems that getting to know that migration network, which has been a pretty challenging task in the past, uh, we can just simply achieve it with more tracking and banding, which seems to be an easier task comparing to quantifying the current capacity at the moment. And then on top of that, uh, habitat loss is just one of the threats that the strawberries are facing. Uh, and despite all of the conservation measurements we are currently doing along the flyway, strawberries are still declining. Uh, and we, I think we really need to start try to quantify the absolute contribution of each of the threats and also the relative contribution of them, like which uh, threats are actually the more important ones for different species or at different sites. Uh, for habitat loss and degradation, as I mentioned, there were a uh, number of forestation and uh, the building of uh, renewable energies on the tidal flat uh, that's occurring on China's coast. And for human use, about uh, direct heating, it's not just about hunting, but there's also fishing bycatch. And also I was recently involved in a project looking at aquaculture protection. So where they're setting up these really fun mesh nets to protect birds from eating, to prevent birds from eating uh, the aquaculture that they're raising in the tidal flat. So it's not, they're not hunting the birds because they're not taking the bird to eat. It's not bycatch here, they are actually targeting the birds. So it's a, a different uh, form of direct mortality that is used by uh, human activity. And also there's climate change and climate solutions. It's not just the climate, the sea level rise that we talked about earlier, but those mangrove afforestation and solar panels 
are the ways where we are addressing climate change that are harming Kroger's directly. So they're, if you're not doing anything, they will be harmed by sea level rise. But if you're not doing it correctly, we will just harm them directly uh, by addressing climate change. And then on top of that, there's interaction among those different uh, threats and also how the migrant strategies will make them more vulnerable. So I hope I was able to end the talk with a more optimistic uh, voice, but I think uh, we're just facing too many challenges at the moment. And I think one of the uh, most critical challenge is how to make conservation more scientific and evidence-based. So uh, I would like to thank my uh, supervisor, David Wilkoff, and my major, major collaborators, uh, major funding resources, field assistants, and thank you all for uh, listening. Happy to take time. Just curious because you set up the talk so well in the introduction when you added those new species onto the, the trend line mm -hmm. and they were so strongly divergent. How did those two species link to those different regions of the, the tidal areas that you were finding? Did that actually correlate and yeah, possibly so, explain that difference? Yeah, so the two species one is from your heifer, which I talked briefly during the end of the first study, where they are pretty much a upper zone specialist or the remaining upper zone spectra, they're foraging pretty close to the sea wall. So any of the changes there, whether it's sediment, whether it's human disturbance, will actually affect them a lot. So that's the reason, I think that's the reason why they're, they've been affected pretty harshly, uh, both locally and globally. And then the Norman's Greenshank is actually a generalist forage uh, everywhere, um, not everywhere, but everywhere at that site uh, where they concentrate. They feed mostly on crabs, but they go out onto the sea uh, 15 kilometers from the sea wall. Yeah. That was a great talk, Tom. Thanks. Very, very interesting and really valuable work. Um, I think following on from that, uh, it sounds like you could estimate the the um, area of upper intertidal flat and then produce a figure that looks, looks the same as that as that last one. Um, but rather than including the whole tidal flat, just include the whole tidal flat. Hopefully, the Springville Sand Papa uh, fits on that mm -hmm. plot more closely. Um, one figure that you showed is that that um, you know you can lose habitat in um, one location, and that reduces the amount of species. Kind of that chain between the migratory habitats. Yeah. Um, recent developments in Morton Bay have used that as an argument to, to kind of justify why you can reduce habitat. Yeah, this this one, reduce habitat in Morton Bay because, for example, that we've got way more capacity than we need. Um, Which may not be the case. Well, <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess what's the, I guess, can you talk about that a little bit more? What could we say to those people? Is that a valid argument? That's, yeah, so I think, so is that not just about the Tonga Harbor, but other places as well, right? I'm talking about Tonga Harbor, but yeah. I'm sure. So I think for Tonga Harbor, there's another argument because they're developing the upper tidal zone, right? So they're basically developing the area that's closest to the yeah. uh, high mark. So that will have proportionate effect on the shorebirds affect their high tide roost and also affect their most valuable foraging habitat. So that's one argument. And then with the recent work on Far Eastern Kurdu, that we see that the probers in Eastern Australia actually may not be limited by what's happening in the Yellow Sea, but rather what's happening both during the non breeding season and during breeding season. So I think that can be another argument for that. Okay. And what's the delay that you see between a habitat loss and a population distribution loss? I don't think we have. Okay. any information on that actually. Okay. So this mismatch between habitat loss and population decline may also be uh, a time lag. There yeah. may also be a time lag there. Yeah. Because strawberries are pretty long so uh, they may not be experiencing any of the mortality when the habitat loss, when the habitat was lost or degraded. Uh, yeah. And the effect may show up like five, 10 years later. Yeah. Yeah. 
And on top of that, there's also a long-term change in reclamation because um, the free dynamic system. So when you reclaim the habitat, um, the tidal flat will either continue to be eroded because of the changes in the hydrodynamic, or you may start to accumulate. So you may actually regain the upper tidal flat, mm -hmm. but you may not regain it at the full extent as what has been there. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And it also takes maybe 10, 20, even 50 years to do that. So they're losing maybe temporarily losing the upper tidal flat, but for pretty a long period. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, great talk. We're taking lots of notes over here. Um, I'm curious about sort of trying to define the baseline for where the stopover sites are and the best be able to come up with a sort of capacity. Are you looking across the entire flyway? The, the last one sort of looked like you were trying to look across the entire flyway. I'm, I'm curious, some of these populations are down like 80, 90 plus mm -hmm. percent, right? Range contraction when your population declines yeah. that much. Are they or is the site ability such on these stopover sites that that you're sort of convinced that they're all coming back to that place, or that there are other places that they would have been using that they're not using, um, even even potentially like other habitats if there were enough of them they were using that they're not currently using because we're just getting the small tiny version of what the population used to do. Mm -hmm. I think in general the idea is that they are pretty feasible to stopover site. So the study we are showed uh, that their local population changes do not match, does not match with local habitat changes. They also look at uh, the species composition at those sites, uh, I think in late 2010s and late 1990s. So the commun community composition didn't change despite all the changes of the habitat the population numbers, but the population uh, structure didn't change. So I think that's a pretty convincing way of showing that they are pretty feasible to those different sites. And also, uh, I think with a lot of the tracking data, uh, it shows that those birds are pretty feasible uh, to the slow over site. So uh, yeah, I think that's why uh, it's really important to identify where those key sites are. I think for some of the sites, they not, may not be uh, that fiscal, uh, because uh, with tracking data, you see that during inclement weather, it will go down at some random site. But for the major site where they're building, refueling, or a really extended long distance bike, those are the pretty fiscal sites. Yes. Yeah, very nice. Well, it's a really good way you do um, you know, structure and also the questions. I mean, I mean, I've been working with long shores in the area quite a long time, and I always think like, DNC is not the only problem, which mm -hmm. you show it in a very nice way. Very impressive. Um, my question is, um, you have a graph like showing the birth day, like you know, of the red law. I just wonder if you have like considered the uh, effects of the local weather you know, uh, when you when you do the calculation, because it seems like so you have has so that you know do uh, the local weather or or, or like, during the migration season, would affect like how long the bird like, was staying like at the stop the site. So, just wonder if you have like uh, considered that or have done anything to tackle that problem. Yeah, for this because it's a only one year study, we were not able to consider any, any of the effect of the temperature or changes in that. But I think temperature and weather do affect the food availability, and when you get really cold weathers. Uh, uh, I think during some following years when we were doing the uh, Schubert survey there, you do see uh, fewer birds at the site, but it's hard to know like uh, whether it's food or whether it's just the weather itself that trigger that changes. I think, yeah, there are a lot of unknowns in their movements that hopefully some of the tracking studies that I'm doing will actually help answer some of the questions. Thanks very much, Tom, for a brilliant talk. Um, you mentioned very briefly the um, temporal variation, right? I, I think you made in Harry mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I'm interested in your comments on how important that is, because it seems to me that you know a site may be um, 
kind of operating below carrying capacity for five years, and then suddenly there's a a bad year yeah. where where the you, you know the number of birds far exceeds the available food. Yeah. Um, there may be those rare events that are really important in driving um, the sort of dynamics <clears throat> you're talking about. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think. Issue. Yeah, I think you mentioned a pretty, uh, pretty broad, pretty interesting points. Uh, and the reason why I mentioned that is because for this specific site, uh, the reason why temporal changes is particular interest is because for these small bivalves are actually the young stage of the species and they're concentrated on the upper tidal flat. So I think their abundance actually depend a lot on the reproduction of the previous year and also the weather condition during the previous winter and the previous spring perhaps. So there will be a lot of temporal variation there. And I think the, uh, so we were able to get away from this question in the paper because we actually compared the food availability of our, uh, during our year and so some previous years, we see that there's no major changes. But I think the point is that, uh, that there may be like really bad years. Uh, and that's why you may want to have more habitat instead of really the site as a add capacity. But then that's adding another layer to this complexity, like how you can quantify their dis uh, this effect of habitat loss. But I, I do agree that that's actually uh, suggesting that we need to protect more habitat than it's actually needed by just quantifying the food availability. Yes. Um. So looking at the graph of the of prey availability, it's like a, a knife edge of the red, right? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, is sea level rise so bad that they're kind of screwed anyway? <laughs> like, you, you know what I mean? Like, like, with the changes, I think that some level of sea level rise is now kind of inevitable. Um, even no further development, do you mm -hmm. think there's actually going to be a chance that these habitat areas are retained, or is, are, are they all so narrow that? potentially with sea level rise, it's, it's going to be a problem regardless of the development. So one interesting part that we found we found during this work is actually, although it's very uh, high food density on that, on that narrow strip, they're not using that very extensively because it's actually very close to the sea wall. So human, dis human disturbance actually prevent them from using that part. So they're actually mostly using the, not the highest part, but the area immediate to this. And also, uh, from our observation, it seems that this part can also be a pretty high quality site, which are not covered by this map. So uh, hopefully sea level rise won't be that bad and it's occurring at a slower rate, I think hopefully, uh, because we do see some sediment accumulation here as well, it's getting softer and softer. So hopefully you can keep sort of keep up with climate uh, change a little bit. Uh, but so the sad story that was not included here is that uh, 2018 and 2019 are actually two of the last years of the glory of this site. From 2020, um, it seems that for some reason the food resources there crashed. Uh, and then you don't see as many run out there anymore. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out why that's the reason. So climate change is actually, so that's why uh, I'm getting more and more worried about the climate change solutions because climate change is actually a, still a long-term effect. It's a gradual effect on us and on the habitat. But then some of the uh, solutions we're having is actually harming those habitats right away. So I think that's that's why it's getting me more and more about those emerging threats. Yes. You mentioned how um, when you your current station has one of the key insect results coming from that thing. But my remote station you can see that they become just like there's high species the species there was at the end and there's lots of benefits as well. So how does that play out in this situation? Because mangrove afforestation is a positive sort of conservation effort. So how does this they put in this and see Yeah, yeah. So um it's um 
a little bit complicated. So um, I think the reason why I mentioned uh, mangrove effort station rather than mangrove reforestation uh, is on purpose because we imagine that a lot of the mangrove deforestation in Southeast Asia and along China's coast is actually they cut down the mangroves and build uh, the short term farms uh, there. But then when they are restoring mangroves, they're not tearing down those farms. Uh, where the mangrove war historically, but they're planting mangroves all down the mouth flat where there has never been mangroves, where the sentiment may not be suitable for mangroves. And that's why I mentioned mangrove afforestation specifically. I think the way to do restoration is to restore where they were, but not planting mangroves on the places where there has never been mangroves. Uh, and also with other uh, restoration projects as well. Uh, but I do agree that mangrove uh, reforestation, reforestation has its benefit. And people have shown that uh, mangrove reforestation actually achieves much better uh, ecosystem services and covers sequestration benefit, all those things than mangrove afforestation. So I may, so I just want to make that uh, distinction better here. And thanks for the question. Forgive me the chance. <laughs>